we're at a crossroads here. We're at a, a critical moment in global energy supply. There's such a realization globally that clean, green energy is critical. We're gonna have a baseload shift to something greener, something different, something that we had for the years but haven't utilized. I think there's a greater appreciation for the positives of nuclear energy than we've ever seen. Uranium is presenting itself globally as being the next clean energy source. I think the uranium market is in the best position it's ever been in right now. There's no path to net zero without nuclear. With 8 billion people on the planet, the fossil fuels that power modern life have become a dangerous climate threat and a national security liability for nations throughout the world. The global push to decarbonize means that replacing oil and coal with cheap gas is not a long-term option. Increasing renewables like hydro, wind, and solar are part of the solution, but these heavily subsidized options come with a variety of challenges. Clean, reliable, and with scores of new reactors under construction worldwide, nuclear energy is stepping in to fill the gap. As it does so, the smart money has begun flowing into uranium, which supplies the crucial fuel for the global reactor fleet. Rising uranium prices have spawned a host of new uranium companies, including ETFs, explorers, developers, and near-term producers. With consensus pointing to continued growth over the long term, a new wave of investment is gathering. Welcome to the second atomic age. We're at a, a critical moment in global energy supply, and in particular, uh, an energy balance that's shifting away from coal, away from a baseload which is primarily globally driven by coal, to a moment where we're going to have a baseload shift to something greener, something different, something that we had for years but haven't utilized, and that's nuclear reactors powered by uranium. Well, the main reason I like nuclear energy is because there's no better um, energy that's clean, um, reliable, and cost-effective. So it doesn't produce a lot of CO2. Comparably in cost, it's very reasonable to other um, modes of energy. And also, it's reliable. You know, it's always available. Once it's up and running, it stays up and running. And the world already has a large fleet in operation. When it comes to carbon emissions, nuclear equals, and in some cases, outperforms renewable energy sources. Crucially, and unlike renewables, it is available 24-7 and doesn't require expensive energy storage solutions to improve reliability. It's a really critical moment because you now have growing awareness and realization that this narrative around nuclear energy, that it's unclean and unsafe, just isn't true and, and was really never was really never true. And instead, uh, if we're going to transition to a cleaner, greener future, we're going to need to do that with uh, a base load that comes from clean energy. And that clean energy ultimately will be powered by uranium. So I'm sure you've heard this before, but the wind doesn't always blow, the sun doesn't always shine. And although hydropower is a great base load energy, what we've seen over the past couple of years is that climate change is starting to have an effect on that water flow as well, which is seasonal. So we need nuclear for that base load energy. We need something that's always going to be available. Added to this is the re-emergence of energy security as a dominant policy. You know, security of supply, from my perspective, really means controlling an energy, in this case, an energy source, from when it's dug out of the ground all the way up through the generation of power. Since the end of World War II, we've known a piece that's really unique in human history. By and large, uh, major wars between superpowers haven't been fought and the West, the United States, Canada, Europe have enjoyed a tremendous moment of peace and prosperity. And, you know, that's changing. An era of conflict is upon us. And so with that conflict, with that uh, increase in, in a world order that isn't governed by peace, you now have a moment where countries, uh, utilities, companies are focused on securing their energy supply. Desperate for energy, Many nations have been forced to burn more fossil fuels to fill the gap, but as they do so, they are also accelerating the transition to clean energy. Countries planning to exit nuclear energy have now U-turned 
and others have announced plans to expand their nuclear reactor fleets. This even includes Japan, where, for the first time in a decade, most Japanese now support restarting their idled nuclear reactors and ending their reliance on imported fossil fuels. Nuclear power stations are not constructed overnight. These are multi-billion dollar projects that take years to build. That's where small modular reactors come in. So small modular reactors, SMR, um, is not actually a brand new technology. A lot of people think it is, but this technology and this, um, I guess, concept has been used on nuclear submarines since the 1950s. The modular is we can build it somewhere else and ship it to you. And it would be in pieces, you know, like a modular home. They are cheaper to build than large construction sites, and they are inherently safer to operate. In recent years, research for commercialized SMR designs has reached into the multiple billions of dollars as the US, China, UK, and Canada compete for domination of what is set to be a highly profitable global SMR marketplace. With numerous commercial SMR projects underway, including preparations for the world's first SMR factory, the stage is quickly being set for wide-scale global deployment. As the global reactor fleet grows, so too must production of nuclear fuel, and that means the world needs more uranium. So the supply and demand landscape right now is as good a setup as it's ever been. You have demand growing and from multiple different sources. So whether it's new reactor builds, it's extensions of existing reactors, or it's restarts of some of the existing reactors, particularly in Japan, the demand side is very strong. Not to mention the promise of small modular reactor technology, which is getting a lot of airtime and will be commercial before the end of the decade. So the demand side is set up very strong. On the supply side, that's where we have a problem. Uranium supply has two sources. Secondary supply comes from things like government stockpiles, under feeding by fuel processing companies, as well as re-enrichment and recycling. However, by far the largest source is primary supply, and that means mining, which has only just begun to emerge from an extended slump. So the reason that there's so few advanced uranium projects is because the industry spent almost a decade in a, in a real slump. Right from the early part of 2011 until the fall of 2020, the price of the commodity was very, very low. I mean, much, much lower than, than the cost needed to spur on new development and really even spur on exploration. The industry's response to new demand is likely going to be fairly slow. It takes time to develop mines, whether even if it's, uh, it doesn't really matter what the commodity is. It takes time to permit, it takes time to develop. So it's difficult for the mining industry to respond quickly to changing mineral prices. So we're not going to be able to bring new streams of production on as quickly as, uh, as the demand needs. Uranium is a very difficult commodity to find and permit and build a mine. Even around restarts of existing mines, they're not going to deliver the amount of material to the market that people are expecting. And again, I think that's going to really pinch the supply and demand outlook and potentially lead to dramatically higher prices. So I think the, the whole industry is really playing catch up now. The price of the commodities improved greatly in the last three years. We think it's got a long way to go, but that decade of, of being low commodity prices basically shut down so many key parts of, of, the, uh, of the industry. When investors think about uranium and the uranium price, there's a couple of different things they need to think about. There's the spot price, which everybody sees, and it's posted weekly, but it only tells part of the story. And really, the bulk of the uranium that trades and that's consumed by utilities in the market trades on the long-term basis. And there's a disconnect between those two prices. And often, the price that the utilities are paying is significantly different than the spot price. And where the spot price drives investor sentiment, it's not always reflective of where the actual price is traded at. So the spot price right now, that is not a sustainable price. That is not the price that will bring on new mines. That's not the price, quite frankly, most of the mines right now can make a profit on. The incentive price of new production, generally the consensus is $90 a pound 
in order to incentivize any new development, new mines coming on. I've seen numbers that, that go up to about $125 a, a pound. I'm, I think it's a little aggressive, but it certainly tells you where these, the sector's going. It basically has to double from where it's at right now. I think we're at the very beginning of the next big bull market for uranium. Even in the last six months, we've seen a tremendous amount of long-term contracting. And so that is a very constructive signal that we're at the beginning of a bull market. When the contracting comes back, and that's what we've been waiting for for the last 10 years is for long-term contracting to come back. It started in earnest, but I think it's only just begun. This bull market could last for a long time. I think one thing that people need to understand about uranium and the demand via nuclear power is once these power plants are built, they'll continue to require uranium for a very long period of time. It doesn't go away. So it's not tied to market dynamics like recessions that might impact demand for base metals or iron ore or these kinds of things. Once a reactor's on, it requires that uranium for 30, 40, 50, 60, in some case up to 80 years. So the demand side is very strong and very consistent. And so I think this bull market could last for a decade. Uranium prices today are nearly triple their 18-year lows of $18 per pound in 2017 and double the price level in 2020. As they have increased, so too have uranium equities, opening up the sector for further investment. Newcomers to the uranium space should look across the spectrum of types of companies they can invest in. So you can invest in direct physical funds that hold uranium. So the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust would be a prime example of that. And you're gonna get direct exposure to the price of uranium there. You can also invest in producers, and there's a couple out there, Cameco being one of them, Kazatomprom being another one of them. And, and of course, you're gonna get access to cash flow and because they're producing today. And then you can invest in advanced developers or exploration companies. You can also invest in ETFs. I think one of the very interesting things about the uranium space today is the surge in the number of ETFs focused on the uranium space, and you can get general exposure to the uranium sector there. I would point out that those ETFs, they don't, there's no stock selection there. They just own the basket and they, they own all the companies in the space that fit their criteria with certain amount of market cap, certain amount of trading liquidity, but it's a very good way to just play the space more generally. And then there's, then you can be a stock picker and you can go and pick companies in the space, whether they're producers, explorers, developers, and there's a number of names to choose from today. You want to look at the full spectrum, you know, do you want to invest in the exploration side? Do you want to invest in the development side? Do you want to invest in the mining side? There's a place for every one of those. I think it's key that um, investors look at all aspects of the, the nuclear sector. Where do you want to be? But key in every one of those decisions has to be the management, you know, standing behind the project that, that you're interested in. Key management, tier one projects, jurisdiction, to me, those are the things that investors should be paying attention to. It's important for the team to have experience in the sector from all aspects, you know, from mining, processing, selling, and raising money for those projects. So I think that it's important to have a good project to go forward and in a, you know, reasonable jurisdiction. I've been doing the uranium business for 47 years this year. And the first day I worked in a uranium mine, I, I fell in love with the uranium industry. I think if you look at a number of the companies that are around, you'll find people that have been in the business for a lot of years and they have a lot of passion for what they're doing. That ground was already taken. I mean, that's These industry veterans continue to lead from the front. Ross McElroy, for example, is a multiple award-winning geologist, co-founder and current CEO of Fission Uranium, which has a near-surface uranium deposit at its PLS project in Canada's Athabasca Basin. It's one of the few projects advanced enough to see production this cycle and has the potential to be one of the lowest cost producers in the world. I started my career as a geologist in the uranium sector. So as soon as I was out of school, I was already in the Athabasca Basin hunting for uranium. I fell in love with it right away. It's been rather successful. I'm absolutely all in. I love the sector. You know, it's a very rewarding industry to be in. And with over two decades of uranium experience under his belt, Phil Williams, CEO of Consolidated Uranium, 
heads up a successful international uranium company that is well positioned for the bull run. We're a global uranium developer with projects in four countries around the world. We're in Canada, we're in Australia, we're in the United States and we're in Argentina. Our focus is on our assets in the United States. These mines are fully built, fully permitted, and have access to a 12 million agreement with Energy Fuels at its White Mason Mill in the US. These mines will be some of the quickest mines to restart, lowest cost mines to restart in the uranium sector. There is no cleaner form of energy that I'm aware of that can be produced on this scale in this intensity today. It's not available. And so um, this really is a moment where technology is advanced, where practices around mining are advanced, and there's a real opportunity here to shift away carbon intensive energy production to something much cleaner and safer. With all commodities, there are ups and downs. There are macro and micro cycles. But if you're thinking about what it means to transition to clean energy, then you know this is really an interesting place to be.